Hey, welcome to the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. I'm your host, Stacy David. This podcast is brought to you by LMC Truck. Keep them on the road is their slogan, and they supply the parts to help you do that. Also, Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals, and hot rods and enthusiasts alike. If you want quality tools, Cornwell's the place to go. Let's get to it. All right, we got a great question coming today, which is a great way to get into a discussion here. It's from Rob, and he wants to know how to negotiate prices on cars. <laughs> kind of fitting to have the question coming from a guy named Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Since a lot of people try to rob you when they're trying to make a deal on a car. Uh, so, Rob, it sounds like you're trying to get a good deal and how you should go about it. Uh, okay, there's a lot of ways to approach this. First of all, I know that most people now have seen the shows uh, Pawn Stars and American Pickers, you know, those kind of things. And so everybody thinks they're a wheeler dealer. And uh, unfortunately, there's two kinds of wheeler dealers. There's the one that is trying to make money off of you like they do on Pawn Stars. In other words, they're trying to get a deal to where they can turn and make money on it. And then there's the enthusiast that just wants a good deal for something that they're gonna enjoy. So they're not really looking to make money off of it. So these are two different approaches. So you need to decide right off the bat which one you are. If you are a wheeler dealer and you are looking just to get a deal to turn around and make money on it, your approach to buying and selling cars is different than the enthusiast. And um, you're basically a used car salesman if you're looking to make a deal on it. And I don't mean that badly, that's just the type of approach. So everything has to do with profit. Uh, most enthusiasts, and, and Rob, it sounds like you from your email, you're an enthusiast. You just want to know how to get a good deal on a, on a project, and how to sell yours at a good price. So let's dig into that. Let's, let's not talk about the guys that are trying to get a, uh, that are buyers and sellers. Uh, basically what you want to do, first of all, forget what you've seen on these shows, the back and forth thing. Most people don't like to do that. About three times is about it. Because then, you know, you run into the guy that's just a professional haggler. And I've been in those situations. I sat out one time, I was dealing with this guy in a car, and we started out thousands of dollars, then hundreds of dollars, and then tens of dollars, and down to 50 cents. And after an hour or so of dealing with this guy, then he's like, ah, I don't really want to sell it. And so he was just, he was just dinking around. He just wanted to, you know, to just talk and see what kind of deal he could get. So try to avoid those sort of guys. Get in with the ones that are, that are serious, and this is the way that I approach a deal or making a deal. In other words, when a, when a guy has a car, I look at it and I'm like, okay, what am I willing to pay for this car? What would be a good deal for it? So say he wants to sell it for five grand. And I look at it and go, you know something? I, I would like to get that car for two grand. Um, but I would pay as much as... 2,500. You, and you need to come up with these numbers ahead of time. And I'm not talking about ripping the guy off. I'm just saying what you are willing to pay for it. You need to kind of establish that. And then you go into that and the guy says, I want five grand for it. Then you can say, well, listen, I'll, I'll give you two grand cash for it. And he may counter with 4,000. Then you have the choice to come back and go, no, I'm going to stick it to or you can go, you know, I'll give you 25, but I won't go any more than that. And, and then it's done. And then if he comes down to it, you know, if he says, well, let's go to 35, you can say, listen, that was my, my bottom price. Unfortunately, a lot of these guys, after watching these shows, they expect you to keep haggling. And that's why I usually get to my bottom price after the second or third time. You know, because then you know if the guy's serious. So... That's, that's what I would encourage you to do. Come up with what you'd pay for it, what you'd like to get it for, and then what your high, what's the most you would spend for it. And then just work it like that. It's really not that hard. Most people are really good about it. Uh, and it, a lot of it has to do with the way you approach it. You know, some people are like, well, I don't want to offend you. Well, then don't. You know, you can offer a guy a, guy a really cheap price without offending him. You just say, listen, this is, this is all I've got. 
and this is all I'm willing to give for this car. Um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, years ago, uh, I went into a Mercedes place. I was doing a lot of work on Mercedes at the time. And I go into this Mercedes repair shop, and they have a 1970 SL convertible sitting out there, and, and the motor's in a box. And it belonged to the daughter of a country star, come to find out later. But anyway, so I go in there, and I was like, I wanted to build one of those cars for my wife. So I was like, gosh, it'd be great to get that car. So I go into the shop, and they say, that car is junk. That car has been to all kinds of repair shops. The motor is in a box. So basically, it's a body. And so I said, OK, what's the price on it? He said, well, I think the car is worth about two grand because it's just a body. Everything else is iffy. He said, I'll give you the name of the girl that owns it. So I call her up, and she wanted 10 grand for it because she was like, well, you know, these cars were stored. I'll go for a 30 and all that stuff. And I was very nice to her, and I said, listen, I'll give you $2,000 for it, and here's why. You got some rust showing. You need a complete build on this thing. Paint job, interior, motor is in a basket. You know, everything needs to be gone through. I said, this is all I'm willing to give on it. She goes, oh, no, I could never do that. Okay, six months later, she calls me up. She goes, I've got an offer for four grand on the car. Are you a player? And I said, nope, I, two grand I'll give you on that. She goes, well, I said, matter of fact, if you're getting an offer for four grand, you need to sell it. Well, <laughs> so I think the car's gone, right? Three months goes by, I get a call. She's like, well, you know, will you take three, you know, will you give me three for that car? And I was like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two for it, but it's been a year now, I might even have to think about that. And about three weeks later, she calls me back and she goes, how about 2,500? Well, now I knew I had her because nobody wanted a car. And I said, no, I'll, I'll give you two grand for it. And she sold it to me. It took me a year to get that car. And, but the thing is, I was willing to let it go because I was only willing to pay because I knew what I was going to have to put into it to build this car and do anything with it. And I had to stick by my guns. And so I, you know, I ended up with it. So that's the biggest thing, uh, Rob, that I want to encourage you to do is stick by your guns. You got to be able to walk away. You know, the moment you get in there and start getting emotionally involved with a vehicle, you're in trouble because then a guy knows he's got you. And a lot of times you end up spending more than you really should on something, which even that in itself is OK if you're passionate about it and it's something that that you really want to build. It's okay to spend more than you think it's worth because, you know, building cars and being a car enthusiast and stuff isn't about making money, you know, unless you're the first guy and you're a used car salesman. Then it is about making money and you're really not the car guy that we're talking about. But for the rest of us, we're enthusiasts, you know, so we will waste money on stuff on a blower or, <laughs> or something like that because we want to go fast, you know, and it's not about getting your money back. It's about enjoying the vehicle. And that is two different mindsets. So that's why I said at the very beginning, you kind of need to decide which mindset you're working from because there are different approaches. Now, when you go to sell your vehicle, this is a whole nother thing. You have to be realistic about what the market value is on it. You may have spent years on it. You may have put hundreds of thousands of dollars in it, but just because you've built the most amazing Cobra kit car out there. You know, you can go on eBay and there's 30 Cobra kit cars for sale right now. So if you really are serious about selling your vehicle, you have to make it competitive with the market. Because remember, it's only worth what somebody's going to give you for it. So you can't look at selling something as I'm trying to get my money back out of it or I'm trying to make money off of it. That's not the reason enthusiasts build vehicles. If you're building a vehicle because you love it and you're passionate about it, you're going to take a loss on it because you're going to put all your extra money in it. You're going to put all these things into it, you know, that it's not really wisely spent money, but you don't care. It's the same mentality of the guy that goes out and spends $500 every weekend to go golfing. That money, he doesn't care. Or the guy that goes to the football game every weekend, you don't get that money back. You did it to enjoy it. So that's, that's how you spend your money. And the enthusiast, the real car guy, that's how we spend our money. So when you get ready and you've got all these receipts and you go in there and you're like, well, I'm trying to get my money back out of it, that is not realistic. I hate that when people say that to me 
because when I'm trying to buy something, they're like, well, you know, I'm just trying to get my money back out of it. And it's like, well, where did you get that idea? <laughs> Who guaranteed you you'd get your money back? You're obviously, you haven't been around this that much because, you know, it's only worth what somebody's going to give you for it. So uh, you got to be realistic in what you got. And um, unfortunately, a lot of times the more popular cars, your Camaros, your Mustangs, those sort of deals, they sell quicker and they sell for more money because they are more popular. Sometimes when you dare to be different, which most of my cars are odd, they're different. Sometimes people spend a lot of money to get something that's different. Other times they'll look at it and go, eh, I'll get a Camaro instead. And you, you have to understand that you can't be mad about that. You know, a friend of mine a while back, he put about $160,000 into a Fox Body Mustang. I mean, it was a beautiful car, beautiful build. But when he went to sell it, guys were offering him, you know, 50 grand, you know, which is a lot for a Fox Body Mustang. But he was all upset. He's like, these guys don't know what they're looking at. And, you know, they just don't realize it's like, yeah, they do. But it's to them, they can go get another Fox Mustang for 20 grand, you know. So you, you, you put your money in the wrong vehicle if it was about making money off of it. So that's some harsh realities there. People don't like to talk about that stuff. Um, and people, a lot of times, they get the, the short end of the stick, they think, and so they get bitter about it. And they're like, well, I got ripped off. And, you know, this industry, you know, doesn't support and that kind of thing. And that's not true either. You just have to understand that this is an enthusiast market. We do this because we love it. And people invest their time and money into things because they love it. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get your money back. Most of the time you don't. But the good news is you will get something back because you've built a vehicle that does have some sort of value to it. And if you go to the movies or if you go to a concert, if you go play golf or that, there's nothing you get from that, just some memories. So at least you're ahead of the game in that way. So you have to look at it that way and just approach it that way. Rob, I hope that helps. Just uh, be careful out there and enjoy what you're doing and uh, give people a good deal and uh, wheel and deal the best you can, man. <laughs> you know, you hear me talk about tools a lot and there's a reason for that because we couldn't do what we do as car guys without tools and we always need quality tools and I always encourage people to find the best quality tool that you can and for me you know after years of doing this decades now I haven't found anybody better than Cornwell tools and there's a you know they've been in business for a hundred years so obviously they know what they're doing they continue to push forward in their tools and their boxes they continue to push forward in new technology I'm always eager to see what they come out with and I will recommend them many times to you guys there is a difference between buying something American and buying something that's an overseas imitation. And you guys that are car guys and tool guys, you know what I'm talking about. So check them out, Cornwell Tools. You won't be disappointed. Okay, here's one that we got into a discussion on a little while back, uh, talking with some friends of mine, and we were discussing used parts as opposed to new parts. And I'm talking body panels. And boy, I'll tell you what, there's all kinds of different takes on this. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit, because a lot of you guys are restoring cars out there, and you're like, do I go to a swap meet or a junkyard and try to find an OEM replacement fender for my Chevelle, or do I just buy an aftermarket one? So let's dig into that. Okay, first of all, OEM, if you can get a good OEM one, that's always my first choice. But that source is almost gone. And just because you find an OEM one doesn't mean it's going to just bolt on and fit perfect. <laughs> Nothing does that. I mean, they have to be fit and they have to be worked and they have to have the gaps set and all that kind of thing. So know that, you know, OEM is a good thing if you can find it. And the prices have come down. There, there was a time not too long ago that OEM stuff was gold. Uh, I was doing a Mustang years ago, a 67 Mustang convertible. And I believe I got the last Ford replacement quarter panel for that car that was even in Tennessee. That, that's what the guys told me when I bought it. And it wasn't even for a convertible. It was for a coupe. I just had to modify it on the top to make it work on a convertible. But I spent, dang, I spent like $1,000 for that quarter panel. Now, at the time, 
there was only, I think, one company that had replacement quarter panels, and I'm not sure they had even the full quarter. It was just the half panel, and it was, you know, 150 bucks, but it was really bad quality. And at that point, I mean, OEM was gold. You know, I was willing to spend $1,000 on it because I knew that I was going to get something that was going to fit in the important places. Well, things have changed a lot. You know, the aftermarket has come out with quality replacements. So now you can get aftermarket replacement quarter panels, bedsides. I mean, the whole bed on Copperhead, when I built that, was all reproduction parts. That was all from LMC truck, from the bedsides to the tailgate, all that stuff. You know, and the quality has come to the point where it's, it's right there with OEM. Now, just as soon as I say that, if you get something out of the box and you think it's going to bolt on and just be perfect, that's not realistic. You're going to have to work them. You're going to have to get some waves out of them. You're going to have to open up some holes. You know, you, you're going to have to make them fit. That's with anything. But, you know, in answer to this question, right, coming back to it, I, I prefer OEM if I could find it when I'm talking body panels, but I have no problem going to aftermarket if I need to. I would not spend the extra money now that an OEM part would cost you in lieu of getting a nice reproduction. You know, one of the big challenges that faces restorers out there today is finding good quality original parts. And there's a lot of places out there that carry custom parts, but finding those original parts can be very difficult. And that's one of the reasons you hear me talk about LMC truck all the time. Because if you're doing a truck project, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, doesn't matter what year, they carry everything. They have got the parts, those little screws and those nuts and those little fasteners that you can't find anywhere, you can find at LMC. So if you have a project, even if you're not working on a truck, but you might need some hardware or something you know, that is Ford, Chevy, or Dodge related, you need to have an LMC catalog because I guarantee you, they got something that you can use. Well, I know that everybody has probably heard the news uh, that little Richard passed away just recently. Uh, gosh, so many of these guys, you know, they're getting to this age. We just lost Chuck Berry not long ago and, you know, Glenn Fry and a lot of these guys. Of course, Glenn was in, in the second tier of rock and roll, third tier, actually. Uh, little Richard, man, he was one of the originators. Now, if you're not familiar with little Richard, <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> now, for you younger guys out there, if you're not familiar with Little Richard, there would be no rock and roll as we know it without Little Richard. And I know that is a huge statement. But let me, let me just walk into that a little bit. You know, obviously, Elvis was a huge impact. Buddy Holly was a huge impact. But with the Elvis impact and the Buddy Holly impact, on the white side, you had Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Fats Domino with the same impact on the black side. And they crossed over a lot of those songs, you know, Long Tall Sally, Tutti Frutti, uh, all of those crazy rock and roll songs that had that three chord thing. That was Little Richard. And nobody could sing them like Little Richard. That little scream that he had, man, that guy would, <laughs> he was something. And he was flamboyant. He was the first of the real flamboyant rockers, you know, which was really interesting that he did that back in the day uh, because it was a very conservative world. The world really didn't know what to think of Little Richard for a long time. If you haven't had a chance, uh, you need to go out and rent the autobiography on Chuck Berry called Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll. It was a kind of a documentary drama thing that they did, I think in the early 90s. And it's, it's about kind of Chuck Berry's history, but Little Richard's all through it. And they're interviewing Little Richard and Bo Diddley, as well as uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, and uh, all of these first tier rock and roll guys. And you kind of see how they all work together and how they created rock and roll as we know it. You know, and they kind of go into a lot of the people, you know, the, the Beatles cut Little Richard songs. Of course, Pat Boone had huge hits on it. That's how they brought the white audience to the Little Richard songs, you know. And if you, <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you want to, if you want to have a really good laugh, 
listen to Little Richard's version of Tutti Frutti. <laughs> and then listen to Pat Boone's version of it. And nothing against Pat Boone. I mean, it was part of the, what, of the, of the era. But man, I'll tell you what, put it this way, it's a totally different approach. And uh, one is rock and roll and the other is what the establishment thinks rock and roll should be. It's just like the car culture, you know, and I, I say that because I, I always, if you've watched the show much, you know that I compare rock and roll with the, with the hot rod movement because they went hand in hand. And the mentality is pretty much the same. It's kind of that raw, renegade kind of thing, you know, where you're, you're, you're creating something new. And a lot of times you're up against, you know, a lot of uh, opposition with that. And uh, these guys did that, and they created this stuff that, of course, has become legendary. But it was not easy. So, uh, little Richard, you know, rest in peace, man. Uh, you, you gave us a lot of really good music, and uh, we'll always be grateful for that. Keep in mind, this podcast is made possible by our friends at LMC Truck and our friends at Cornwell Tools. All right, that wraps it up for us today. It is time for you to get out there, start working on something, build something with your own two hands, send in your questions, send in your pictures, let us know what you're working on. All right, we'll see you later. <laughs>